Welcome to this very special edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Paris Blues here in the heart of Harlem. Tonight blessing the band stage, the music community came out here to support a very important milestone for a very important iconic jazz figure in jazz, the great John Coltrane for his 97th birthday. And Jazzmobile decided to put together a very unique concert which was rained out, but some of the musicians who were slated to perform came here to perform tonight in honor of the great John Coltrane. And tonight, one of those musicians is a legendary drummer, record producer, as well as executive, the great Norman Connors. Mr. Connors has a very deep connection to Mr. Coltrane. One, he performed with Mr. Coltrane at the age of 16 at the legendary Peps in Philadelphia, his hometown. Also, Mr. Connors also performed as well as toured and recorded with the legendary Archie Shep and the great Farrell Sanders who was his mentor throughout his career. Now, tonight here on The Pace Report, you're gonna see the New York jazz scene come out here and support Mr. Coltrane with Mr. Connors leading some very important Coltrane songs. So sit back, relax, and enjoy highlights of the 97th birthday celebration presented by Jazzmobile, featuring the legendary Norman Connors, live here at Paris Blues here in Harlem, here on The Pace Report.
Partners, it's an honor for me to sit down to break bread with you about not only your career, but we're celebrating John Coltrane's legacy. And you being from Philadelphia, tell my viewers the very first time you saw John Coltrane perform. Uh, I was about 14 or 15 years old. And I got a chance to play with him when I was 60. He had Farrell with him, Farrell Sanders, McCoy Tyler, and Jimmy Davis. And I played with him for three days. And I played with him a second time in New York at the Village Vanguard. And that was the highlight of my whole career. That's, I started off high. Right. Tell me the impact on the band stage and also off the band stage listening to his music. What was it that Train did to you mentally as a musician? Uh, his playing was so spiritual. It had, uh, it had such, such an impact spiritually on everyone and it's definitely on me. And he didn't talk, he never sang though. He kept the horn in his mouth, even on his brakes. That's the way he was, he didn't speak. Sometimes he would speak in, uh, like, uh, in terms of colors. He would say green, red, red. It would be a song like Impressions. And uh, blue would be a song like my favorite thing. John Coltrane influenced a whole legion of saxophonists after him, including another one of your mentors and a very dear friend of yours, God rest his soul, Pharaoh Sanders. How is it that Train at 96 years old, he would have been 96 years old, what was it about his musicianship that turned a lot of those musicians on to what he was trying to do Musically as well as sonically. Well, uh, the last year he was one, one of the greatest influences uh, in music. Him and Miles Davis. And Miles was my mentor and Max Roach. Miles, Max, Miles and Max Roach was my mentor. Uh, Train would have became a mentor, but he didn't, he didn't speak, he didn't talk. But I'm glad I got a chance to play with him. And then when he died, I went, I went with Farrell for a few years. And that's the closest I can feel that I've gotten to John. Because Farrell had so much John in him. And John loved Farrell. John felt that Farrell had some things that he didn't have. And, and, uh, and I watched Farrell's career and my career. My career came out of Farrell. The record companies came and got me. When I was playing with Farrell with the Bay Vanguard, they came and got me. And I used to play with my shirt off. <laughs> and they came and got me. <laughs> I done heard some crazy stories about you, Mr. Connors. I, I want to talk about Mr. Sanders because I've interviewed Mr. Sanders a couple of times here on my show. Um, when he died, the first thing I did was I played your record that you produced for him, the legendary record with Phyllis Hyman. And um, the reason I played that because there's always this spirituality that I have connected with Mr. Sanders' music. And you playing with him and then eventually producing Mr. Sanders Tell me about the things that Mr. Sanders imparted to you as a musician and as a person that you're still applying to the band stage today. Well, like I said, one thing about Farrell, when I met John Coltrane, I met Farrell Sanders in Philadelphia at, at a club called Peps. It was on Broad South. And McCoy. Well, I met McCoy when I was a kid because when, when I was like seven, eight years old, McCoy used to come to the projects where I was and, and uh, rehearse with 
another one of my favorite you know, artists, Nate Morgan, in the projects. Nate Morgan, a bass player by the name of Spanky the Brett, McCoy on piano, and uh, a saxophone player, his last name was Harper, on the saxophone. And uh, I used to go two day rehearsals. I was young, very young. But I was at the rehearsals every day, the day we were rehearsing. So that was a big part of my uh, my legacy. Being around such great people, and you know, they were geniuses and prodigies at such a young age. And I got a chance to play with Billy Paul when I was 15, running on the road with I was 15 years old. So my teenage years, I was always working in the clubs around Philly. I used to work every weekend. And uh, so I had a lot of experience before I moved to New York when I was 17 with some of the heaviest musicians in the world. So, and when I got to New York, I met Miles when I was 13 in Philadelphia. And I was dressed like him. And uh, he went down to the floor when he saw me. He said he never seen anything like that. I was just like, just like white silk scarf, black pat, pat leather shoes, double breasted chalk stripe suit. And I was 13. And when he seen that, when he seen that, he said, I mean, he just, he went off. <laughs> so I got a chance to eat with him. I was with my uncle. After they finished, it was a, a, a restaurant not too far from a place where they played that called the Showman. The, the club name was the Showman, which is a block away from where I met John Coulter. And uh, everybody used to eat at this place. I went with them, sat next to Miles, and I ate. I ate with them. He told me when I could, if I ever come to New York, just knock, knock on his door. And that's what I did. So when I was 17, I had my drumsticks and $20. I knocked this door. Yeah, I knocked this door.
Another heavyweight who I also profiled on the show, the great Archie Shep. You were on a couple of Archie Shep's recordings, and Shep comes from the whole train, Pharaoh Sanders, the spiritual jazz thing. What was it about Archie Shep's musicianship and the stuff that he was doing that set him apart from his contemporaries? Archie Shep heard me with Pharaoh. He heard me with Train, and he felt that he wanted me to record with him. You know, I was pretty lucky to have some of the great, the greatest saxophone players in the world, and some of the strongest and most spiritual saxophone players, and they all loved me. You know, so Archie caught me for his magic of juju. Yeah. On impulse, and he was one of John's favorite. Favorite the horn players, him and Farrell. Farrell, right. That was John's art. Those guys. So when John died, I was work, I was praying with Archie Shep at Slugs. They brought the note saying John passed away. I was with, with Archie Shep. How did you take his death? How did a lot of the jazz community, especially the ones that played and, and were real close to, how, how how did that affect the musicians? Well, uh, inside. Me. Broke my heart. And uh, take your time. I was, I was getting ready to work. So when he died. Although it made up, made it up, being with Pharaoh. I was always with Archie. Right. 
And uh, so, you know, I'm just glad I've got a chance to work with them and study all this music. And uh, I know all the songs. And uh, we were 300 miles, they were one of my favorite music. I have a record of yours you did on Max Jazz. And you did a beautiful rendition of Naima. What? Naima. On, on that record you did on Max. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I said, man, this. But when I heard it, I, I knew where you were coming from. You were you were thinking about one of your, your heroes. But also at the same time, you revisioned it to make sure that the next generation understands and picks up what he means to you as well. Yeah. It meant, it meant a lot to me. I didn't get a chance to work with him as much as I wanted to. But I was young. Just, just a little bit of time I spent with him uh, meant so much and it covered a lot of years. Just a little bit of time I had a chance to, to uh, play with him and be around him. Like I said, he didn't, he didn't talk. He always had the horn in his mouth. Always playing. So, you know, no, I got, you. So I got a chance to play with Farrell so much. Mm. We played everywhere, all around the world, and, and we played a lot. How long were? How long did you play with Farrell before you actually started your solo career? We three, did those three years. Three years. Three years. I started my solo career. My first album went number one in Japan. Yeah. And I took. A group, Gary Boyd, was one of my favorite alto players. Uh, Keeper played by the name Al Alma Gibson from Philly. Reggie working on bass. And uh, Al Barker on sax. And Eddie Henderson on trumpet. That's my main man. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. So, Henderson, something else. <laughs> so they were they were like the forerunners. Okay. Young, they were the young lions. Yeah. And I was glad to be a part of that. And we played 10 concerts all over Japan. Wow. George Wiener called me and told me he had $50,000 for me. Mm -hmm. I never seen that kind of money. Right. And I was only, I think I was no more than 20. So. I want to elaborate on your albums. And I, I have, I'm 51 and I'm still telling people about the magic of your first four solo records and the canon of musicians that were on your first four records. I'm talking about Herbie Hancock, Cecil McBee, Billy Hart, Carlos Garnett, um, Reggie Workman, Ananjay Allen Goons. You had, at that time, in the early 70s, some of the most important black American jazz musicians on the scene. How did you internalize how you were going to put these bands together for these albums? Um, I was going to school in Juilliard and I said, uh, I knew what I wanted to do as far as being a band leader. And I had my influence between Train and Miles and Farrell. So when I became a band leader, I think I put it together the way Miles would put it together. Right. And I tried to get Miles to play on my first album. I had Herbie and Ron Carter said, let's go home. And, you know, so the best thing, the next best thing for me was Eddie Henderson. Yeah. He played like Miles. Mm -hmm. So uh, then I got a chance to, to play with Freddie Hubbard. He was the other guy. So I recorded with him and played with him. And that completed my... My, my situation with the kind of guys that I wanted. Had Lee Morgan not been 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 murdered, would he have been on your on your album because of the Philadelphia connection? Yeah, you know, definitely. Oh yeah. When when Lee Morgan got shot yeah. at Slugs, I was there. Jimmy Merritt was a bass player from Philly. And he was never the same since then. 
Morris Day and Lee Morgan got killed. Tell me about Lee Morgan as a person and as um, a musician. Lee Morgan, when I was in the projects, he, he, to me, he, he was he was a giant. And uh, he, was, he was always a giant. And I liked the way he dressed. I liked the way he carried himself. And he was a friend. Mm. And, uh, and that's what I had to relate to at the time. You know, because uh, he was, it was easy access for me. And I went to his rehearsals, so I got no close to him. And I watched him. Watched how he walked, how he talked, how he, you know, he studied. And, you know, he was a, he was a giant to me. So when I got the, the train and miles and all that, I was already, I already had me walking in me. He was part of me. Your first four records. Dance of Magic. Yep. Dark and Light. Yep. Love in the Sun. There you go. Snoopy. There you go. Yeah. Some 50 years now have passed. Are you still happy with what you put out? Are there some things that you could have done better? Are there some things that you want your, the next generation of drummers and musicians to understand moving forward what you put out? Well, my first four records, I was, I was just being honest. I did exactly what I wanted to do from what I had gathered. I had gathered a certain amount of musical knowledge and a, a certain amount of spiritual knowledge. And I tried to put that into the things that I was doing. And uh, my first four records were honest. And, and, and they had a big influence. They got, they got a lot of play. Yeah, my style style started changing with the females. Dee Dee Bridgewater was my first first artist, and she went she went over to the Woods and went to Tony. And, yeah, but she had a lot of Sarah on her. That's what I liked about it. But after her, when I got to Suitfoot, Gene Conn was the lady, and we traveled around the around the world together. Now Gene was already with Doug, and they had done those great- Black jazz. Black jazz, yeah. In California. Yeah. But I took Gene on another, I opened up even more with R&B. Yeah. On jazz and R&B, mixture. Right. So she got that experience with me. And Kenny Gamble heard it, and he snatched it. <laughs> <laughs>
lot of people admire about you is that one, you have some very different musical approaches. You're a record producer, you are an accomplished percussionist drummer, and you are a band leader. Tell my viewers what the role of a record producer is. Well, my role as a record producer, and I, and I was produced right from the start, I was a producer. Uh, having a concept, bring your con concept to fruition, bring it, bring it to life. And whatever, you, whatever I thought about, I did. No matter, uh, you know, I mixed things up. Like, I would have Herbie Hancock playing, who was genius, of course. And I would have Al Anarchy Allen Gums next to him. So, to look at Allen Gums next to Herbie Hancock, he, he was just thrilled. But, well, so when I got into him, him being next to Herbie, who was his idol, it was something. So I, I got all those feelings. I, I got Herbie, and here's a new guy, talented guy, next to him, next to his idol. So I got all those juices together. So those are kind of things I used to do. You know, I was the first one to record Stanley Carr. Yeah. We made you some Philly. Now the Philly connection. <laughs> I brought, when, Fel, when Stanley came to New York, I introduced him to Farrell, and we already had Susan McBee playing bass. And Farrell, uh, uh, Farrell uh, used both of them. Yeah, as a producer, I picked my songs. Right. I picked certain songs. I picked every musician. Everything was very hand-picked. Depending on the on the composition and uh, the, the, the body of work, so I thought I did it right or did it good. I did it the way I wanted to do it uh, with the body of work and the people that I picked. I, you know, it's almost like having an army. You got all the right people. You got the right ammunition. So, so I had. The right guys. I was part of it, and I had the songs. I knew songs. I knew songs because I used to go to a place called the Earl Theater and watch Duke Ellington mm. perform live. I was a kid. I sat in the front seat. I watched people like Callum Basie, Cab Calloway. Sammy Davis Jr. with his brother, with his father and uncle. Billy X Duck, his big band. Johnny Ray, his big band. So I saw all this great music. Sarah Brown, Elephant Justin. I was part of that. I was young. So I had all that in me. So when I started, when I started to produce my own stuff. I had all these giants all in me. So, it was like walking. So you were very interested in the architect of crafting the band. Because Ellington wrote for his musicians. Basie, with his arrangers, accompanied the musicians. And I see what you've done with your jazz records and your R&B records. There were the stuff that you created for Phyllis Hyman, Gene Carr, Michael Henderson. How do you hear those songs and those musicians before you put the band together? Like I said, you know, I could pick any song. You know, I would think about the song and think about them. I had them, and I could, I, they just needed the song. I had to get the right song where they could soar and, and be themselves and, and, and dynamically capture and got close to the audiences. So I had, so I was 
So I utilized it. What was the first time you saw and heard Phyllis Hackman? I was in New York. I was living in New York. And I was recording my first album, You're My Star I was, I, I started, I had Alan, I John and Gums, I had the songs. I had this, I always liked Betcha by Donnie Well, Tom Bell. Star listens. He's a beautiful job. Another Philly connection. <laughs> yeah. But I heard it different. And that song kept it kept hitting at me. I said, wow. I mean Star Lessons version was so pretty, so nice. Who's singing group do I? Which could, which I was into, I like that. But I thought it could be so much more. So that's what I did. So when I heard Phyllis for the first time, she came to New York. Somebody called me up and said, there's a girl who just came to New York and she's working, she's working for the door. You need to go see her. She seemed like she belonged with you. And Jean had left, went to Philly at Nashville. Cause I said, what am I gonna do now for brokers? Although I can always use Jean. So I went to this club, Russ Brown's, for the song about five songs. And I said to myself, thank you, God. You sent, her, you sent this to me. So I went to Phyllis, I said, Phyllis, my name is Norman Connors, and I would like to record you. And she says, everybody tells me that. Everybody tells me that. I said, I'm gonna come get you in two weeks. I said, I'm working on you and my starship album. And I got three or four songs I want you to do. See them with me. I came and got her. Took her to the studio. Magic was there. Michael Henderson was stunned. He had somebody else in mind. I said, no, I got the girl, Mike. He had some girl in Detroit. I said, this girl is going to, is going to, going to excite the world. And both of y'all together. Yeah. The thing that I love about your revisioning of Bet You By Golly Wild is you walk in do, 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 with the, the, the sax at the beginning and then it slows down and then she comes in there's a fire. And you walk right her, she walks right through the song 
and she takes her time with this. You slowed it down or you slowed her down to make sure that people understand the lyrics of the song. Was that your intention of that? Yeah. Well, she's she sung uh, super clear. You can really hear every word and expression. You know, you had to guess it all. Right. She was super clear. And the thing is, that was a, a Dodge Joe Allen Gummer's arrangement. So I gave him a shot because I had her every handicap. But I gave him a shot on that. He came through. And even more than that, which is part of my sound, is Gary Boyce. But Gary did this song. And that Gary, Trevor Simon, Gene Corn, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's my sound. Yeah. Stanley Clark. You know, I have a self certain sound. Yeah. I, mean, I have an album I'm doing now. It's called Love. And I got these amazing people. People Bryce, Howard Hewitt, Bobby Lau. I don't go in the studio without Bobby Lau. Great piano player. Doing his arrangements. Um, Gene Cohen, doing the back I have a new singer, her name is uh, Marvin King. She's a single prince from Nana Rishi and Steve. I have another new girl, her name is Theonita Valentin. She went on the road with us. She lives in Tampa, Florida. And uh, she's a single prince uh, with uh, Tom Brown. So I got in my Starship Orchestra. So I got the I got the people. And I'm excited because I, I get that feeling that I had when I first started using the people in my first few hours. I'm feeling like that. So I got something special. It's called royalty. And everybody I feel is royal. Everybody is everybody got their thing. And we can and for me to bring it together. To bring it together. And it's gonna be out there. And it's gonna be forever. The collectors out there. I want to talk about Gary Bartz, and I want to talk about members of your orchestra. Gary was part of the first three records, I, if memory serves me good, first four. And then he, you bring him into the R&B side. What, what, what was it about Gary as, an, as a saxophonist that you saw that was very different? Gary was a great jazz player. I made him, when he did my stuff, he was a great smooth jazz player too. Yeah. He played the things that Kenny G and all of them couldn't play. Had a little funk to it. Had a funk to it, had, had the jazz to it. And it was just so unique and so beautiful. Yeah. So when I called him, I knew when he puts his part on it, I knew I had something. I had something before he, before he came. And then when he comes, that puts the top up. Yeah. That's Gary Barnes. I met him when I was 14. And Gary and Michael Henderson go back to the Miles Davis, the Davis era. And Michael, God rest his soul, was the complete package. Michael could sing. He was an incredible bassist. Very good looking. The women, <laughs> women were gaga for him. And he was also an, a dynamic band leader like yourself. How did you guys partner get together? Well, I was there when Miles got it. Okay. Miles changed his music. I was I was there with the changes. Cause I used, used to go with Miles at Miles house every day. And I was just close. And he really liked it. I loved him. He loved me really. And uh, it's every move. I used to watch him and hear him play certain things in the house. And he cooked. And just watch him. And it was early. I wanted to be like him. But 
and then uh, I start noticing that I have something. I got my own thing. And he recognized that. He, he used to tell me, just be yourself. Because he liked me. And he kept telling me, don't try to be like me. I had an old, different, my mother raised me different. He used to do things, and I'm, I'm back up. He saw that. And he used to tell me he liked the way I was raised. He said, I'm a different man. I said, you're a different man. So, um, he, he encouraged me to do my own thing. And that's what I did. I got my own sound. A lot of people try to compare me with Quincy Jones. And, you know, nothing like that. No, nothing like that. Yeah. But I'm not like I got my own thing. Right. What was it about Michael that added to what you were doing, especially with the You Are My Starship moving forward? Michael had a certain bass sound from Miles Low. Miles used to tell me Michael is the best electric bass player in the world. That's what he used to say. I said, okay. Yeah. And Ron Carter and Paul Chambers, all that. There was the upbreak, guys. He was still in club. But Michael had a certain bass feeling, him being from Detroit. He had it. He came from that James Jamerson. James Jamerson. Um, so, he said, I'm coming with you. So when he came with me, and Tome and Reggie Lucas, they all came with me. <laughs> <laughs> now, now that we're talking about did you know that Michael could sing? When did you find out that Mike could just... Well, we did. <laughs> Nobody knew Michael could, could sing. When we did Valentine Love, he wrote it. He wrote it. He put Gene on it. He said, yeah. He said, find a, a male vocalist that could do it. He did the demo. So... <laughs> I came I came back to him. I said, you're the singer. He looked at me like, are you crazy? Are you crazy? I said, you're the So we, I, I, we went in the studio. I just defined what he did. It was a masterpiece what he did. I said, you're the singer. I, I told him, you, you're going to take Marvin Gaye's place. Yeah. So that's what we did. We went in. He sung with Gene. The duet became a big hit. They still playing it now. Valentine Love yeah. is a classic. When we went in to do the Starship, it took about 47 takes. He got mad at me. But when we got that one take, why did it take so many times to because do Because Michael was, wasn't really a serious singer. He, he, he was a Bebo. Although, I got him to the point, he was just as good as any singer yeah. there yeah. was. Yeah. Just for those couple songs. So it, it, it just took more. It took more. Not on bass. On bass, he's right there. Yeah. But this vocal, I know if I work with him, I know what I want. I can get him to that point. And I got him to that point on Star Trek. He's so magnificent. You got you're responsible for him being signed to the label you were on, Boot. I was I was yeah, and, and Phillips. Yeah. 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 I wanted to take Gene, but Kenny Gillum was nice. Did you do you produced the first two Phyllis Hyman records, right? Yes. How was because as a producer you told me this do you hear the song and you hear the voice? In her first record, how did you sit down and say, okay, this is how we're going to move forward with you? Well, one thing about Phyllis, when we went, when, when, when we, when I did the, the You Are My Starship album, which was super, super popular, Frankie Crocker loved it, and everybody loved it, you know, it was a big, big hit. 
brothers felt, felt comfortable being with me. She come to my house every day. We study uh, uh, Sarah Vaughan, Ella Fitzgerald. Were Nancy. those her? Were those her favorite singers? Yeah, Nancy Wilson. Nancy Wilson. Yeah. But but Phyllis was Nancy's favorite singer. Oh, really? Sarah Vaughan. And I asked Nancy. I asked Nancy, I said, did you tell Phyllis that? She said, no, I didn't get a chance to tell her. Because Phyllis was dying. Right. But Nancy said that she called me and said, whatever you have for Phyllis, I, I want it. I want it. I said, I got a couple of songs. A tell Phyllis song. Somebody loves you, girl. Mm. You can turn it. Somebody loves you, boy. I was going to do that on Phyllis. Now I was going to do it on Nancy. So Nancy told me, Phyllis was her favorite singer. I see, every time I see live performances of her, when I listen to her album, I hear the clarity of Nancy. And, I, and, and it makes sense now. She did eternalize a lot. That was one of her favorite yeah. singers. Yeah. Yeah, she was Phyllis' favorite singer, and Phyllis was her favorite singer. everything. I mean, we got such a... We have everything. All the songs from all the different types of artists. Even country. Our country people. Even blues. B.B. King and all those blues people. All, all, all the jazz people from Duke Ellington to Count Basie, Miles Davis. The Lawyer's Mom. We got everything, and it's all recorded. Everything is there. A person can go, no matter where you're at or what you're doing, or if you want to hear something super beautiful. We technology is now just push that button, YouTube, and you get it. Get everything from Johnny Mathis to Marvin Gaye to Tommy Hathaway, Ella Fitzgerald to Aretha to Shaka to Pat LaBelle, Phyllis, anything you want. Did even Little King Price, or, you know. Everything is at our fingertips. Everything is. Fingertips. We got some of the greatest music that ever was that ever was uh, put together on the planet. I know it's there for me. Nine times before I go to the studio, I used to listen to Dion Moore. Certainly she did. <coughs> and, uh, you know, she was so beautiful. And those songs, the way she interpreted Burt Back like things. This gave me inspiration. I used to listen to Miles too. I could listen to Miles, listen to Dion, listen to Johnny Mathis. And I'm ready to go. Listen to them. Put me in the right space. 
Thad and again for this very special edition of the Face Report reporting live here at Paris Blues here in Harlem, New York for the 97th birthday celebration of John Coltrane. I'd like to personally congratulate and thank the incomparable Norman Connors for his time. Look out for Norman coming to a city near you featuring the legendary Gary Bartz. I'd like to personally thank Robin Bell Stevens of Jazz Mobile as well as Clarely McClare of Clarely McClare Public Relations for arranging the logistics for my time with Mr. Connors. Also, I'd like to personally thank the Hargris family for their warm hospitality. More good news, Paris Blues will be opening the beginning of next year. So please find out more information. Follow me on Instagram by way of Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, as well as jazzmobile.org for more information. I can't stress this more than enough, people. Please like, share, and subscribe to my videos here on YouTube and Vimeo, as well as leave comments, as well as follow me on social media. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace.